I first met Kevin, I think it was in 2008, when we invited Kevin here to show, um, have a film screening for Unrepentant. And um, it was very well attended from members in the community as well as people from Ryerson. And one of the things that I remember most from that was after we, and we showed the film in its entirety, and it actually played quite well. We had a little bit of problems at the beginning, I think, with the DVD, and then we used a VHS or something. Um, so um, I remember at the end, there was a woman who stood up for a question, and she thanked you for doing this work. And she was um, a Cree woman. She brought her 14-year-old son. Her mother was in residential school, and she never had that conversation with her 14-year-old son. So bringing her son to your screening actually opened that door to start that conversation with her son. Right? So that was something that I remembered. Another thing I remembered was another person in the audience um, who had recently come to Canada stood up and said she never knew this history about Canada and she was embarrassed on behalf of Canada. So those were the two things that I remember most from the uh, film screen with um, Unrepentant. Okay, good. Okay. We're going to put Carrie on the spot right away. So. <laughs> Um, okay, so as I said earlier, um, what brought Kevin, Annette, should I refer to you as Kevin Annette? Or well, it's Anna, but call me anything, just don't call me a cab, you know what they Because I called you Kevin Annette the last time, so I didn't call you Reverend. That's right, so. I've been called worse. There you go. <laughs> so um, some of you might know Winnie, and she is the, I think her, she's the chair or coordinator of the Sam Yinden chair here at Ryerson. And she's the one who actually brought um, Kevin here for this um, book, book, it's not really a book launch, but book signing. Is it a book launch? No. What do we call well, it's, a, it's a prolonged launch. Prolo a prolonged <laughs> launch. Um, so I wanted to read a some words from Winnie. Um, I wish to express my sincere apology for not being able to attend this event in person. For the past two and a half years, I chaired an action center that worked with a group of 2,000 2, auto parts immigrant workers who were made jobless as a result of sudden plant closure. Tonight, there is a graduation ceremony for 400 of them who, against all odds, has, have successfully finished their second career training. Because the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities is attending, we ended up having to organize the event around his schedule. So again, my apologies. In 2008, the Canadian government finally issued a public apology on the residential school system. Now the general public can breathe a sigh of relief, feel good about themselves, and carry out the collective blindness to the colonization of Aboriginal peoples on a daily basis. There seems to be a sense that we have apologized. What more do you want? This collected, gated mentality of racism and colonialism is rooted in a sense of superiority that is ingrained throughout the last 500 years of conquest. Today's event is one of the many ways to continue exposing the unspeakable crime and devastating pain carried out by the deliberate policies, laws, and practices and actions of governments on Aboriginal families, children, and their communities. In reading Kevin's book, I, and she calls you Kevin, <laughs> so I'll call you Kevin too. Um, in reading Kevin's book, I'm reminded of Isabel Knockwood's moving memoir, Out of the Depths, on her years in residential school in Nova Scotia. I'm reminded of her acts of resistance, the courage, and perseverance. Her book and her story is a testimony of the survivors of the residential school system in reclaiming their own voices and their own history. Too often, history is written from the perspective of the colonizers, those who are powerful. It is in this spirit of resistance in exposing what has been made invisible, I welcome Kevin to Ryerson, to a space where we can engage in critical dialogue, share perspectives, and identify strategies to challenge the normalcy of white supremacy, racism, colonist, col colonialism. So again, I welcome you on behalf of uh, we. Thank you. My name is Carrie Lester. Uh, through my mother, I am Barefoot Onondaga from Six Nations, Onkwehongwe, Haudenosaunee. Um, my path and Kevin's path uh, came together about nine years ago after my mother had died. And we were starting to research who we were and what we were. And I started coming across Kevin's research work. Unbeknownst to him, I was uh, following his, his, uh, 
his research for a few years before I actually met him. So I met him personally about four or five years ago when he came across Canada and he had his, uh, one of the first speeches that he gave over at Boise. And uh, several of us here in this room met there for the first time. So Dave in front here and Rhonda behind. Uh, we all met there. There were several others of us that met together and began uh, some work here in Toronto to support Kevin and the work that he was uh, um, putting together. Also, in, in regards to uh, myself and my, my language and my, my people, the Onondaga. Uh, last summer I took a language course in Onondaga, so I'm going to, uh, if you allow me to, say a few words in Onondaga that I learned. So, Gangwa de Sanaskakwa Gyaje, Ogwayosida, Niwagesede. Anandagega, Niwagase, Niwaga, Wendjoden. So that is my name. Is uh, Skip? It was a nickname that was given to me this past summer. Uh, I said that my I don't know my clan, but in place of clan, I put that I was barefoot because that part I know of, of uh, the Onondaga, and that my nation is Onondaga. So I just put a few words together to remind myself of how um, Kevin and I came together, and about Kevin as well, uh, for through his research. So, Kevin Annett, for those who don't know, uh, has worked tirelessly for the past 20 years um, learning about Canada's Indian residential school system and the policies behind it and advocating for those whose voices have been squelched. 20 years ago, not much was published about residential schools, but a lot had been written. The government had their documents, the churches had theirs, and the schools had theirs. Much of this has been kept locked away all these years. But some of it was destroyed, some of it naturally by floods, and some by fires, which maybe not so naturally. Some of the, some of the buildings were, were burnt down by the children themselves, so records were destroyed that way. The unnatural way of, uh, of destroying these records was that the government themselves destroyed records three separate times to make way for more important documents. Kevin Annett is one of the select few who have devoted their lives to digging for the truth, behind this system of exploitation and destruction. Others have devoted themselves to covering up these same truths and will stop at nothing to keep them hidden. This is not an attempt on my part to be dramatic right now um, because horrible things, things happened then and horrible things continue to happen today for people who are uh, digging into these, into these truths. So um, I'm gonna take a little bit of artistic license here because I've read Kevin's book and seen the film numerous times and a lot of the images are just sort of in me, and I'm just going to relate to them as I remember them from his film and his writings. So Kevin found himself uh, working out as a minister in, as a United Church minister in Port Alberni, BC, and he had no idea what a residential school was at the time. But he was soon to find out when he asked his church elders about the absence of the community's native population from the church pews on Sundays, which amounted to a significant 30%. He was told that they keep to themselves, and we keep to ourselves, and that's how we like it. So Kevin isn't one of those to take a non-answer like that. So he set about introducing himself to that Native community. And after much persistence, he began to gain their trust. Soon he was performing weddings, and funerals, and baptisms, and more weddings, and funerals, and more funerals, and more funerals. And at one such, I think it was at a wedding uh, that Kevin was at, uh, one of the men, and it might have been the groom for that wedding, I'm not sure, um, became melancholy and was looking out over the landscape. And I think he was wishing that his brother was there, if I remember correctly. A friend, okay. A friend who had died, with a wish, wishing that friend had been in attendance at this wedding. When Kevin asked him what happened to this man, he told Kevin that the man was buried out there pointing out towards the back property, which I think backed onto the school. So he's buried out there with the rest of them. That building is an old residential school that we all went to. A lot of us died in there. And that was the beginning of Kevin's nightmare journey into residential schools. Not nearly as bad, as, uh, as horrible a journey as, as those who actually went through it, of course. So Kevin would naively approach his church administrators uh, and they reminded him to leave the Indians alone. He couldn't believe that that would ever have been their response. The more he asked though, the more they clammed up and, be and they became worried about this new minister that they had taken on. 
Kevin wanted to hear more about the lives of his new neighbors and what these residential schools were all about. He spent a great deal of time, I would imagine, getting to know them. He's always believed that everyone has something to say and that learning and teaching go hand in hand and that everyone can do both. He held a position that would, uh, that would allow and he held this position as a minister that would allow all people to have their say. Right there up in the church, at the pulpit, everyone could have their turn at the mic. And this annoyed the church administrators. Natives did not come to this church. Through his visits to the community, Kevin saw how destitute some of the families were and felt that a, a bread bank could certainly alleviate some of the hardship that they were feeling. Again, his administrators were none too thrilled. Kevin continued with it until it came to a time where I think some financing was needed from the church to continue the, the, the food bank, the bread bank. This they would not do. All the while, Kevin was becoming fast friends with this community, much to the chagrin of the white settler population of Port Alberni. They were becoming more and more uncomfortable with native people in the church, in the sitting in the pews, talking from the pulpit, and gathering for the food, gathering for the food bank. Eventually, stories began to surface about the residential school, right there in the church. Sons and daughters, husbands and wives, cousins, aunts and uncles of the perpetrators were right there in attendance. You can imagine what this was doing to the non-native community. At some point, Kevin noticed some paperwork on the desk of his bosses, which talked about a land sale and a logging company. The questioning of this piece of information was to be Kevin's downfall from that church. This land sale had to do with the United Church illegally selling off native land being held in trust to the logging company McBillan Lodell. He was fired from his job over the disclosure of this information. Throughout this time, Kevin was becoming more enmeshed in the lives of, the native, of his native neighbors, and he was distancing himself from the non-native population, and his church elders took advantage of this, convincing his wife that Kevin was going a little bit crazy a little too obsessed. In fact, they were so convincing that his wife agreed to divorce him. With the church paying for it, no money for a food bank, but thousands for a divorce. But those were the early days, and Kevin eventually produced a documentary film, which we'll see part of tonight, called Unrepentant, Kevin Annett and Canada's Genocide, which documents the stories that he was hearing from the community it was all too much, I think, just to listen to these stories and not to take note of them. Filming became, I think, a better tool to record them than simply writing them down. It was too important not to film. We'll see some of this film tonight, hearing from some of the survivors, many of whom have not survived since the making of this film. And Kevin has moved on, moved into areas that I don't even think he would have imagined even a few years ago. He has gone from the birthplace of this genocide and back again, traveling to the UK, Europe, and the Vatican itself, and back again several times now, hearing more and more stories of the systematic abuse at the hands of church and state. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. <clears throat> when, you, when you do what which you think is right in a certain time and place, there's, there's a higher purpose for what we do. And there's hidden forces that, that are at work. And I know that now, looking back, at the time all it was was kind of a mindless horror that I was going through. And uh, it resonated as I began to get, learn and get to know some of the survivors because their experience too was from that mindless horror that they went through. They each had the choice to make about what they're to make of that in their life. Would they allow themselves to be crushed by it, allow others to use it against them and their people, or would they learn from it and grow from it and get strength from their own pain and come together with others? And that's what's happened. That's the miracle that's happened. And I wouldn't say it's a miracle from on high. I'd say it's an ordinary miracle that just comes from all of us. And that's something that keeps me going to watch that inspiration every day. Some of the people who've inspired me in this are right here in front of us, and I wanted their image. Can you all see these folks? No, I'll hold them up. On the bottom is Vicki Stewart. She was a, an inmate at the Edmonton Residential School run by the United Church 
in 1958. She was murdered in there by a staff member.